have one. We have one item on the agenda for this committee hall. It's a legislative update. Uh, Preeti. Uh, thank you, Council President Prince, Council Members. I'm Preeti Sridhar with the Executive Department. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Doug Levy, who's been working very hard for us in Olympia to make sure that our legislative priorities are met. Now, when we planned this meeting, we thought we'd planned it just perfect. End of session, we'd be here today with all our priorities being met and you know everything on a go. But as it happens, uh, April 29th, we have a special session that has just started. Um, it's still for all the reasons that we're hoping for that all of Renton's priorities are met and you know we come away with this uh, with a lot of success, transportation, revenue package, operating budget, uh, capital budget, and uh, some of the uh, you know laws there that we want to make sure work uh, for us and work together. Uh, but I won't uh, share much. Uh, Doug will give us a good update of everything that's been going on so far and what we can expect in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, my last comment before turning it over to Doug is we've really put up a very strong united front this session uh, as a city in partnership with other cities, with some of our other stakeholders. Uh, we've really worked hard to impress upon our legislatures what's important for us and what's important for the region. So. I want to thank all of you also for your support for that. Well, good evening. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I think what you just heard proves that, you know, the spirit of idealism burns bright in the, uh, in the employees that are hired by the mayor and the council. So <laughs> I love Preeti figuring we'd have it all done by the end of April. Um, Alas, that hasn't happened, and so we did want to give you an update on what's happened with the regular session now concluded, the special session that's underway. I mean, I think synthesizing from our perspective for Renton, a lot of what we hold near and dear as priorities are very much in play. I think there are larger forces around that we have to kind of wait for things to settle and sort. Um, and so what I'm going to do is go through, um, from a big picture standpoint, what's going on to have caused the special session to occur, and then zero in a bit on our priorities and let you know where we stand on all these pieces. So um, first slide, why the special session? Um, there are still operating and capital budgets to be negotiated for the legislature for 2015-17. There is also a transportation budget, though, as I'll get to, that's kind of the easy pickings among the two-year budgets. There's also um, ongoing negotiations over a new revenue package for transportation. And then there are a few policy bills, including some that affect us, um, dealing with, for example, how we're going to institute a new marijuana regulatory and revenue sharing system um, and also a possibility of a bill that will get into things like um, uh, restoring uh, the growth in liquor profit revenues or what we call revolving account monies. So the session can go up to 30 days, began April 29th. Um, if it's not finalized by then, the governor can call a special session. I noted July 1st as the big watch date because if um, a second special is occurring and things aren't finished by July 1st, that's when you can have at least partial shutdowns of state government because um, all of the agencies will not have budgeted monies to work with. You know, I mentioned to you a few budgets that are still in play, but I think the real, um, the real delay causer, if you will, is the operating budget. And I, I think that's because you have some very fundamental philosophical differences between uh, the majority parties in the House um, and the Senate. In the Senate, you have Republicans, or what they sometimes call the majority coalition uh, in the majority. And then in the House, you have the Democrats, both by very narrow margins, but both with very specific ideas of what they think should happen in terms of an operating budget and managing the state's responsibilities on 
K through 12 in particular, where there's a court order hanging over the head of the lawmakers. So um, there's a question, obviously, of whether the money that's coming in the door from the, you know, what we call the current law revenues and tax policies is enough, or whether in order to satisfy five to six billion dollars worth of responsibilities on K through 12, the new initiative 1351, and all the other various obligations, including things like mental health, whether the state must have new revenues on the operating side. And that's a very, um, that's a very tough disagreement. Um, it's not for me to say one's right, one's wrong, but um, you have House Democrats and Senate Republicans coming at this from very different places on the spectrum. Um, you know, I've listed some of those things that are the biggies. Um, collective bargaining agreements are fully honored in one budget and not the other. Um, Initiative 1351, interestingly, both the House and the Senate look at the K through three class sizes and trying to reduce those versus going out to all uh, class sizes. And one of them, the Senate says, we want to take the K through three approach and have voters ratify that. The House would rather do that, get a two thirds majority, um, and basically in the future try and honor the initiative. So those are different philosophies. Um, and then you have a number of tax incentives, most of them in the Senate budget, things like um, tax incentives for R&D uh, and for enticing data center manufacturers. Um, and those are kind of in limbo until the rest of the budget gets figured out. Transportation revenue package, I would say in relative terms, um, there's a lot of agreement um, between the Senate and the House. Remember the Senate passed their revenue package out uh, through the floor. The House passed theirs out of committee and then has kind of parked it in the Rules Committee. But in terms of uh, a three-year phase-in of gas tax increases, um, using bonds, using a variety of fees, the types of projects, a lot of commonality between the House and the Senate, but I listed for you some of the toughies that they've got to work out. Um, you may recall the Senate um, really tried to put um, a hard brake pedal, I would call it, on the governor pursuing a low carbon fuel standard. Um, they basically said that if he were to do so, a bunch of money dedicated to multimodal accounts would go into the overall motor vehicle account. Um, the House didn't go there, though I don't know that the House wants to have a completely free reign for the governor, so that has to be worked out. Um, the Senate, you may remember, uh, depended on almost a billion dollars of sales tax basically being redirected into transportation. They ended up doing it as an exemption. Uh, the House didn't do any of that. Um, the House did assume uh, about $1.3 billion in what's called practical design, which is a newfangled way of saying the use of designing a project so that you can um, save some money, cut some costs. Um, the House Chair, Judy Cliburn, put, as I said, about a billion three worth of savings into her package. The Senate did not do that at all, so that's a big chasm between the two. Um, and then, you know, closer to our region, Another one of the areas of dispute involves the level of commitment to sound transit in terms of new revenue authority, new revenue options. Uh, it's the equivalent of about $11.2 billion in the Senate. It's um, sound transit's full $15 billion request in the House. Um, capital budget, and again, we're going by gradations here. Um, Definitely a doable negotiation, but some, some differences of opinion between those bodies. Um, I think in the House, in general, uh, more of their funds going into housing and environmental wildlife recreation programs. Um, they do not get into any changing or re-racking of the Public Works Assistance Account. The Senate puts more money into toxic cleanups, more money into some local projects, parks and trails. Um, they do, in their both their operating budget, they move a bunch of money from the Public Works Assistance Account into the general fund. 
And so they attempt to backfill that in the capital budget with a pretty heavy transfer of, uh, or excuse me, backfill of money through bonds at higher interest rates. Um, and then they take about $64 million worth of projects and fund it in other places. So in one sense, the Senate holds the, the projects in the Public Works Assistance Account harmless. In another sense, it would be a very big change going forward. Um, and then I mentioned to you the transportation budget, a couple of niggly differences, but that's not going to take long for um, the House and the Senate to figure out. It's current law. It's basically maintaining the transportation system we've got. And yes, there are differentials around certain grant programs, but um, you know, again, in relative terms, that's not going to be what keeps these folks in Olympia. Um, so that's kind of an, an overarching look at what's going on. And then let's take a look at where our priorities fit into all of this and are affected by all of this. Um, so first of all, with transportation, obviously no surprise, our direction from all of you was um, get in there, roll up our sleeves, try and do our part in helping convince the legislature to enact a comprehensive transportation revenue package. And in our communication to legislators, the things that we hold important, we talk to them about, you know, would you please put the money out there to finish the connector between 405 and 167 and do the new lanes between Renton and Bellevue. And we've always made the point that, uh, and, and the mayor's really emphasized this, that's not simply a Renton issue. That is a regional problem solving that needs to occur. Um, and so we've put a real emphasis on that. Um, you know, I'll share with you some good news there. Um, and obviously, we've, with many of our colleagues, Preeti talked about our efforts to work in coalition with others. We've said we think it's important for you to distribute money directly to cities and counties. Um, we think it's important for you to maintain and enhance, if possible, some of the core grant programs. So in terms of 405, um, I think the good news is that um, there's over a billion to in both the House and Senate packages, and that's great. Um, we're a little more pleased with the House because the House chair, who obviously in her district knows a bit about what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis on 405, she really tried to front load that investment. She put um, 65 million in the very first biennium, 225 million in the 1719 biennium with the clear intention of getting that direct connector constructed and enabling the whole 405 project to probably be done in seven to eight years. Um, the Senate puts the money there, probably wouldn't get constructed nearly as soon. So that's something we've tried to convey to some of the negotiators that we do have a preference for the House version there. Um, on direct distribution, um, both of them have put some money into um, uh, put, you know, direct distributions to cities and counties, not as much as we ideally would like, um, but given all the demands of their package, a representative amount. The House, as you can see from the numbers here, is a little bit higher. The other thing I will say about the House direct distribution that we would prefer a bit is it is directly linked to the gas tax. And so it would be in statute and, in essence, locked in. You wouldn't have to go back in future by any and appropriate it. In the Senate, it's $375 million. Um, it is money from um, multimodal accounts. So um, it would be a bit bulkier in that you'd have to go back and uh, appropriate it each year, or each biennium, I should say. Um, and so um, there's a little bit of a differential there. Grant programs very close together. I've shared for you that um, you know we've we've used the Freight Mobility Board a lot as a granting agency on things like the Strander Project. Um, I think our guys have become very adept at applying for Transportation Improvement Board grants. The amount there is less than we ideally would like. We had hoped for more like 80 to 100 million of new money for the TIB, um, and then you see complete streets. Um, where we think things like the Sunset area would be terrific candidates. Um, 
and that's 160 million. Remember, this is all over 16 years, so that's the rough equivalent of 10 million a year for a grant program statewide. On the fiscal stability side, um, we had a number of items that we talked about when we put together the agenda. We wanted to restore um, full excise tax distributions. We wanted to bring back the revenue in the liquor revolving accounts, as I mentioned. And we, we always try and talk to our legislators about options and tools and ways to control our costs. So we're caught in that vortex, like a lot of other jurisdictions, of, of a difference between the House and Senate um, in terms of the operating budget. Uh, the House operating budget, which um, counts on a lot of new revenue, um, holds the liquor excise tax distributions completely harmless, brings them back to the historical 100%. Um, in the Senate, there's a $26 million transfer um, of that, which is a little over half, to the general fund. Um, the Senate budget also transfers from money from what I would call a back of the budget fire disability payment program. 9.6 of the 10 million in that would be transferred. Um, and I mentioned the public works assistance account. Um, we're a little bit more fortunate that we don't have any pending projects impacted by any movement of public works assistance account monies, although obviously we've still been supportive of keeping that, that whole account whole. Um, so um, while both bodies do, for the most part, keep the state shared revenues intact, you can see where the Senate does some transferring and manipulating around. And we've given you the impact on Renton, which we've made our legislators very aware of. Um, you know, that's 760000 plus for the biennium, um, so $380,000 a year, and that's the equivalent of several officers on the streets. That's a big deal. Um, and so the mayor's been on record with our legislative delegation saying, we'd really like you to keep that liquor excise tax distribution and the fire insurance uh, disability payments whole. Um, so um, I mentioned earlier the proposed substitute House Bill 2156 that has had a hearing in the House Finance Committee. It is something that we're told the House very much intends to move. It is a big bill with nine parts to it. Um, a couple of the ones who are watching more closely, part one um, restores over about a three by any period of time um, the traditional growth in the liquor revolving account. That's what we used to call the liquor profits. And right now, under current law, that's capped at a 2011 level, um, which is about $49 million going to cities and counties. Um, that's not such a bad thing in 2015. In 2020, 25, 30, 35, if we don't get that kind of thing fixed, our share of those revenues will just slope downward. Um, so that part one is a big deal. Um, we also need to not only get it out of the House, but get it through the Senate within a 30-day special session, so a lot of work still to do. There's also a part four of that bill that allows local agencies to recover their actual costs when public records are sought um, for what appears to be a commercial purpose or a profit nature. Um, we'll see how that goes. There are opponents to that going forward. Um, so those are some of the pieces on fiscal stability that are in the mix for this 30-day special. Um, public safety, traditionally something we try and prioritize in our agenda. Um, we um, listed several pieces here. We wanted to make sure that the legislature was sharing some percentage of the marijuana excise tax under the new Initiative 502. We wanted them to fix the mess with um, sort of a Wild West mentality on the old medical marijuana and dispensary situation um, versus a new regulated 502. Um, I think we've got a typo there. That should, be, that should be BLEA. -E we wanted to um, maintain or enhance funding for the what's called the Basic Law Enforcement Academy training. And um, we also, working in particular with um, Representative Pettigrew as a lead, we wanted to see 
if the legislature could continue to grant money for um, gang intervention programs where you all with um, South County and Alive and Free have fared very well. So uh, marijuana revenue sharing, one of those things that's still outstanding, still needing to be finished during the special session. We don't particularly love this first biennium number. It's about 12 million to be distributed across all of those jurisdictions that have retail outlets. That doesn't go a very long way. That will um, switch to a higher amount, um, something in the 20 to 25 million um, in the second biennium. And then we hope grow from there on a percentage basis. That's what the House um, bill had done. The Senate was more of a flat amount. Um, and we're also trying to get rid of a 2022 sunset clause that's in the House Pass version of this. So several complexities we're trying to deal with on 2136. The nice thing is it's in play. The members want to do it. While there won't be as much revenue sharing as we believe is, um, is merited, we will have something going forward. And that's better than 2014, where all of that hit the cutting room floor. Um, good news on our, our need to see the medical and the 502 reconciled and harmonized with one another. That has happened. Um, the governor has signed Substitute Senate Bill 5052 into law. Um, he did veto a few technical pieces of that. One thing he did not veto where he had some request uh, was what's called cooperative grows. Um, that would be your smaller home growers. Some of the legislators didn't want to entirely um, repeal that. They are repealing what we know as the collective gardens. That'll be gone by July 1st of 2016. But there's still some anxiety, I would say, about these cooperative grows that can be up to um, four, what do they call it, four cooperative grows per parcel. Um, and that looks a little bit to some like a smaller version of the old collective gardens. Um, so we'll see how that um, sort of shakes out. The Liquor Control Board, I think, is intending to draft very tight rules for that. The legislature will have some time before July 1st, 2016 to maybe put some tighter restrictions on that and better define it and we would hope limit it. Um, on the Law Enforcement Academy funding, again, a differential between budgets. Uh, the House operating budget puts several new classes for um, the Academy training into play. Um, the Senate does not, so we'll see how that um, plays out. Um, the Senate budget does a little more um, for gang intervention grant funding, a million dollars. The House does 500000 That's one of those situations where we actually want to, um, if we could do the Frankenstein experiment, we'd like to clone the language from the House, which puts money a little more directly on the ground, and the money from the Senate. Um, and then... Both budgets are pretty close, do a pretty good job on things like sex offender address verification, auto theft prevention where the state passes money <laughs> through. Um, the Senate budget's a little stronger on those categories. Um, and the E911 funding is five million in both of those budgets. Um, and then on the quality of life side, and then we wanna give you all time for any questions you may have, but we made a very ambitious request. Uh, um, uh, as part of a whole lot of work and a whole lot of investment that you all have kicked off over the years with the Sunset Area, um, we tried to really pinpoint the idea of a Sunset Area neighborhood park as a, as a sort of a gateway to this revitalized area and something that we thought could be uh, a great complement to the types of um, uh, affordable housing and other quality developments that you're putting into play on the infrastructure side. So the good news is the Sunset Neighborhood Park project is in both budgets. We're very well positioned. We, it, it's hard to imagine that we won't see funding. Again, we have one budget we like a bit better than the other. The House is at two million. The Senate is at a million five. Um, and what I will tell you that I think is really encouraging is uh, this project is physically within the 11th district. Your leads on it were 
um, Representative Zach Hudgens and Senator Bob Hasegawa. But you know, similar to what we what Pretty was mentioning earlier, where we've tried to work in in coalition and across lines. Um, we had a whole lot of members that were very helpful on this in the Senate. Senator Litzo specifically asked his ranking member or his, um, his chair about this project. Um, Senator Jayapal really went out of her way to write a letter, talk about how important this was to her. Um, Senator Kaiser, as the ranking member who gets to help negotiate the capital budget, really liked what we were doing up in this area. And on the House side, um, a lot of folks, Tana Sen put this on her must-have list, though it's outside her, um, her uh, district. And so um, just some very good help on that project, which we really appreciate. Representative Burquist was great on this one, too. Um, so we know that this is in. We know that this isn't at the $3.6 million level. But I wanted to give you a little bit of perspective. Um, there's. Uh, between the House and Senate, you can figure there's going to be between 90 and 100 of the uh, what we call the local community projects where something like Sunset fits. And um, if you look at those 97 projects in the House, there were only five that had a higher earmark than the two, point, the two million that we had. And if you look in the Senate, which is a little skewed because remember I told you that they were actually finding some other grant programs to stick the public works assistance accounts sort of the large loan projects into. But even there, only 19 out of 90 had a higher earmark than the one that we had for Sunset. So while I'd like to be able to sit here and tell you we got you the 3.6 you asked for, I feel like we did OK. And I'm really appreciative um, not only of the work that you all did, but in the reception that you got from there, from your legislators. I think it really speaks to the quality of the ask that you had. I think they all know about the federal grant that you're waiting to hear on, and they know that there's going to be other revenue sources in play, and they're not alone here. Um, the last thing I'd say is I just I want to underscore, um, you know, we slog down there in, on the day-in, day-out basis, but it is super helpful when the mayor and Jay and Preeti come down and our council members um, I want to thank Council Member Perez for coming and testifying on 405. Again, in the spirit Preeti talked about, it was a rent in Bellevue production where we, as, um, as both communities, talked about the importance of the project. And, um, you know, Ruth comes down one time to Olympia and she's in a news release, so she's already a <laughs> budding superstar. Uh, surprise, now. surprise. Um, we know who to send uh, next time. So, um, that's our that's our spiel and i hope it's answered a lot of your questions but if you have others please fire away any questions from council i ask you one um so the uh second substitute senate bill 5052 when do you think we'll start seeing any sort of noticeable change in medical marijuana versus 502 well, I think we're going to start seeing some right away in that, you know, those, those Green Cross facilities, if they're not licensed, they are going to have to go away. The medical purchases um, are going to have to be made through the licensed facility. So you'll see that change on the ground. Over the next year, you'll then see the collective gardens go away. Like many things, it's, it's going to be incremental in how we see it play out on the ground. Um, but I do think it'll be a much cleaner system than, than the mess we've been trying to deal with um, up until now. Council Member Perez. Thank you. Okay, Doc, let me see how, we, how can I put this question. In your experience, um, what you are seeing that is happening right now with the uh, transportation package, um, seeing that it's getting frustrating because it's about right now what one leadership wants and another leadership, you know. What do you think are the odds that this will not happen this year? Um, you know, if you had asked me that question last October, I would have put the odds at a transport, of a transportation package at 34 and 70 against, and I probably would have been one of the more optimistic ones in the room. Um, but I think now, I think the odds are better than 50-50. I, 
I think there's truly a recognition that we need to do this. Um, and I think it's both parties. Remember the Senate, when they passed their transportation package off the floor, had 20 uh, Republican yes votes. Um, so both parties feel vested about this package. They both have you know, strong-willed leaders who want their version of the package, and that's always tricky. Um, but there are also a lot of good people in the room who are negotiating this who I think want to get to the finish line. I, uh, you know, I think it's no secret we've talked a lot with Chair Kliber, and I know she wants to get there. I think um, Curtis King, the Senate chair, equally wants a package, and he's from the Yakima area. It would be easy for him to say, this isn't my deal, this is your deal, you crazy Central Puget Sound people. But I think he understands that it's a connected network and a connected fabric. And so I think there's a lot of good people in the room and the odds are, 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 are better than 50-50. I think we'll get there. What about our representatives and senators? Where are they? Um, well, the, the um, sort of the awkward dance of the special session is that for a lot of the members, they're in kind of the same outside looking in process that we are. Unless you are one of the in the room negotiators on these budgets or on the transportation revenue package, you're very dependent on you know the briefings you get in your caucus or little snippets of information. In our case, we happen to have on transportation, um, Representative Cliburn is in the room. Um, um, Senator Joe Fain doesn't any longer have Renton in his district, but I think we're close. Um, and I think people like Senator Litzo have a good rapport with him. So I think on transportation revenue, we've got some people um, who we work with a lot who are either in the room or with a pretty close connection to those in the room. On, um, on operating and capital, it's a little different. The members who are negotiating those are by and large, not our area legislators. Um, but there's some people like on the capital budget, um, Senator Kaiser does have a little bit of Renton in her district. Um, Senator Mullet is from a neighboring district. So we do have some folks on capital who we can go to. On operating, um, it's largely folks outside our area. Representative Pat Sullivan is in the room. He's 47th, so I guess close by. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Preeti. I'll just say, uh, before we go, as I, Doug was mentioning, those who've gone down, I didn't want to, to go without notice that uh, we had our council president go down with us during the legislative action days, too. And it's, Ed knows everybody down there anyway, so it's, you, you get indoors uh, mm -hmm. a little easier when he's down there. But it's, it's, it is wonderful to have council go with us. Uh, we've said again and again when, um, to have the mayor there, to have a council president there or a council member there, the legislators will allow us in a lot more doors than have just Doug and Pretty and I are down there. We, we spend a lot more time in the hallways if we don't have an elected official with us. So it is really nice to, to have you guys go down. We know it takes a lot of your time, but it is much appreciated. Yeah, and I make the mistake of thinking of our council president sort of as one of those on the ground insiders because he just knows the terrain down there so well. But I, I would echo that. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Terrific. I'll slip you that 20, J. <laughs> Thank you. May the hall was adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, Dave.